vocational trip to Germany. I got this from Don, so I'll give you a little bit of a introduction here. Basically, uh, some Rotarians and two of our members took a trip to Germany, and it was really an educational focus more than a humanitarian focus. Really, the trip was one in which they were looking at Germany's approach to the technical education and uh, really looking at their process, which has got some unique differences from how we, how we train or how we, the process where we might take a higher education from, from high school. Theirs is a little more of a fast-tracked approach, and it seems to be working better, at least in that country, or has some, some betterments. So uh, why don't we welcome Don and Bob Erickson. The presentation is informal, so interrupt when you want and ask questions. The, the um, vocational training team approach in Rotary replaced the group study exchange. And what happened in, the, in this transition is it became more flexible. We can send all Rotarians on a trip. We can do no Rotarians. We can do any kind of combination. The old group study exchange just had one Rotarian and a group of professionals. They went over for a month somewhere, and then they sent another team over here for a month. We're hoping to get an exchange out of this trip, but that wasn't a requirement in this one. So our trip purpose was to visit Germany and to learn what they do with their technical training. Also visit with the technical institutes and the companies to find out what the best practices were, and then experience the German culture. We got there on a Saturday, and on your tables is the itinerary. If you want to take a look at those, we had a very full schedule. We arrived on Saturday evening and spent Sunday at a museum, and then we started off of, on our, our technical education by first starting off with Mercedes, Index, and then one of four Rotary Clubs that we visited. On Tuesday, we went to Carl Zeiss Corporation, and that's the reason why we went to Stuttgart, because Hennepin Technical College already has a connection with the Zeiss Corporation here in Maple Grove. So we chose Stuttgart and then arranged the rest of the trip around that. On Wednesday, we met with their Chamber of Commerce, another Rotary Club, and Trump. And in the evening, we had dinner with the German American Women's Club. On Thursday, that was our college day. We saw the University of Stuttgart's Technical College and then uh, Max Eisuth Schule. And at night, we had a presentation that we'd made at the, another Rotary Club. On Friday, we ended up at uh, Lap Cabell, and then a final fourth Rotary Club before we headed back to Frankfurt. Here's where we went. We started here in Frankfurt, and we came down here on the Autobahn, and our driver was none other than Bob Erickson. He's not only good behind a wheel, he's, he's just as good behind a wheel as he is behind handlebars. <laughs> So we had a fun trip down here and then uh, spent most of the time in the Stuttgart area. Uh, Zeiss Corporation is a little bit further out here at Oberkoken. So that's kind of a, and, and remember this name because we stopped there on the way back to Frankfurt. So this was our team. We had two Rotarians, two instructors from Hennepin Tech, and two students. So myself and Bob, Dick Granlin from Hennepin Tech in the machine tool area, Dom Ramanuj, who was the electronics instructor, and our two students, Sarah Monkey and Andrea Roberts. What raised the eyebrows of the Germans is we had two top students who were women. And they said, how do you do that? <laughs> and it also raised their eyebrows because both of these students were over 30. And one of the things that uh, really blew the Germans' minds was that most of their students are 17, 18, 19 when they start college. And this is a, oh, how did that get in? This is a picture of your president, Dave Wallach. I don't know how that got in there. <laughs> when we were there, we talked about some of the things in Minnesota, like our companies. And so this was one of the slides we highlighted there. This was our departure day. Do you remember March? <laughs> this is Minnesota. And then when we arrived, this was the vineyards on, along the Audubon, and you can't see all the buildings and all the people are here because Bob was driving so fast. It's kind of blurry. <laughs> Good thing you weren't there, Chief. <laughs> <laughs>
This is our there, first. There is no speed limit in Germany on the autobahns, except in selected areas. <laughs> uh, we stayed at the B&B Hotel just on the outside of Stuttgart. Stuttgart's in kind of a valley, and so they're restricted in how they can expand, but this was out towards the edge. And the first night there, Saturday, we uh, had to check out our surroundings, so we were walking around trying to find a good restaurant, and we did. Uh, and I can't remember the name of it, but, but uh, we had a good time that first night just kind of getting to know each other. And this is a little information on the Hennepin Technical College that we shared with some of the people we were seeing. They uh, founded in 72, two campuses, 9,600 enrolled, 52 degrees. There are two-thirds of the students are day students, and then a third are in the evening. And uh, I'd like Dick to say a few words about the, the uh, machine tool area, because this is his expertise. Dick. Yeah. So I'll keep it quick. Uh, want me to use that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've been with uh, Hennepin Tech for over 20 years now. I started at Eden Prairie teaching high school through District 287. Uh, for five years and then fortunately the instructor on uh, Brooklyn Park campus retired and that's close to, close to home for me. I live in Fridley so a lot less driving and so average age of my students is uh, 32. 34 actually now. Uh, a lot of them changing careers because of the economy and so on. Uh, best job I ever had. I love working with people um, and so uh, again, I'll keep it short, but we've been totally backed by administration on our, on our equipment, which is great. Um, and I want to thank, uh, I want to just take a second to thank the uh, Rotary Club for the trip. Uh, we had a uh, really educational time over there. I've been sharing it with my students. Um, I'm going around with uh, Bob and Don to some of your Rotary meetings in different cities. I've met a lot of great people, and I just want to thank you for the opportunity. It was great. Made a lot of, I, I guess the last thing I'll say is a, a huge part of my occupation is networking, and we made a lot of connections over there. And uh, uh, networking with industry, with other colleges, with other students, and it was a great experience. So I just want to say thank you. I would like you to say one more thing. Yep. One of the fun things we learned about was geocat. Geocaching. <laughs> How do you pronounce that? Geo geocaching. I'm a geocacher. Explain what that is and, and, and what... He was, he was the most excited about this Yep. anything we did. Yep. <laughs> so a couple times uh, I see we had a, 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 a law enforcement person. Um, a couple times I've been uh, asked about suspicious activity because I'm digging in a pine tree or out in a swamp or something like that. And the next thing it's... Well, my wife bought me a handheld GPS. Can you show me how to use it? And so we're out in the parking lot doing a little uh, instructions. So thank you for your service, by the way. Um, so anyways, <laughs> geocaching is basically, Don brought it up. Uh, been doing it for about two and a half years. I found, I'm going on 4,500 finds. Uh, I've got 97 of my own out, most in State Forest. Uh, Sand Dunes State Forest up in Zimmerman, I've got a bunch. Uh, and I wanted to find at least one in Germany so I could mark it off on the map. It came down to the last day, and I got up at sunrise and uh, hiked down to the vineyard that was close by and found one. And so I was excited about that. So These that are great. capsules that are hidden around the world. Yeah, basically it's like an adult treasure hunt. You, <laughs> you, you dig around and whatever. Uh, if you looked at geocaching.com on the map, they're all over the place. There's uh, like four million uh, geocaches. Where it's a worldwide, very popular type of thing. And for me, my wife and my youngest kid, they like to go to the gym for exercise. For me, I'm climbing trees and cliffs and <laughs> out in a swamp looking suspicious. <laughs> but all I'm doing is I'm just looking to find that, that uh, log book that's in a container. So that was kind of a fi fun that's side great. trip there. Thank you, Dan. So these are pictures of our Hennepin Technical College and some of the machinery we have in the tool and die, some of the computer-operated uh, spinning machines, and then the electronics area, which was Dom's area. And they have uh, two associate degrees and a two-year diploma degree. So they have two paths that they can follow on that. 
And this is a picture of their typical uh, electronic classroom. So with that information, then, we started off Sunday morning after we had uh, finally caught up a little bit on sleep on Saturday. And we started at the, the uh, museum. This was our kind of our, our fun time during the whole week before we got started. And uh, so we met at the Mercedes Museum. And that's uh, Sarah in the sculpture that's in front of the museum. And there we met the district governor of that area of Germany. And he and his wife gave us, set up the tour for us in the, uh, the museum. This is uh, Bernard Gehling. And of course, there's the obligatory exchange of flags. What they did different is they have a district flag that they exchange. So he gave us that flag. Now this is the uh, Daimler, first Daimler Benz Auto. Daimler is the guy that invented the one cylinder um, motor. And Benz invented the carriage or the buggy that you see. And they combined it into the first auto. As they were trying to grow the company, the Daimler Benz company, they uh, interested a sheik. And they built this one for the sheik and they built six more. And that flow of money helped the company get started. Now, this sheik had a daughter named Mercedes, and they liked that name, so they changed the name of the company to Mercedes-Benz, which is how it's pronounced in Germany, and we pronounce it Mercedes-Benz. So we got to see a lot of the cars there. This was the first limo, the first Polkmobile. <laughs> this, this was an attractive one for the whole group. This, this car, they made seven of them. This was the one in the best shape, and that's uh, valued at 1.9 million. We suggested, Dave, that the president <coughs> should get to drive that. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> and at the end of that uh, brief tour, then we uh, took a group picture. And over here, I want to point out, this is Bernard Schott, or Bern Schott. He's the host partner for us, and he set up a lot of these special places we got to go to because of his uh, location there in Stuttgart. And, and I have to inject that without the work that this gentleman did, none of this would have happened. Uh, Don is very modest, as you all know, and it was between he and Bernard that, that this thing really got arranged. Uh, it was a, a lot of work. So we then he gave us a tour of Stuttgart, and we had an exchange of his flag with our, our Bloomington flag. And the next day, then, we started off on this quest to find out more about this dual vocational training system that they've got there. And so we started off in the Mercedes plant, and of course, no photos are allowed inside them, <laughs> right? No photos allowed. However, we did see a very efficient assembly line with lots of robotics and very intense quality assurance. In fact, it's at the different stations, there are neon lights, red or green. And if they were on task and they're producing the quality they're supposed to produce, it was, there were green lights, and if they weren't, they were red lights indicating how far behind they were. One of, one of the secrets of, of Germany is that the programs that Don was talking about, this dual program, they actually, the students actually work in the factories and then they go to school. But what ends up happening is that the factories, like Mercedes or Index <coughs> or Trump, can have somebody that is trained in the company lore, knowledge, and things like that. So when they get done with the program, they don't have to stay with the company, but many of them do. Mm -hmm. And if they stay with the company, they're ready to go to work. And we'll cover this a little bit later here in the detail on, the, on that, but we picked up pieces from each company we were at. And of course, we didn't get any free samples when we left, but that was okay. Probably couldn't have fit into the car anyway, right? <laughs> then we went to Index Factory, and again, there were no photos. They are very uh, complex spindle machines, and. Uh, they also had the dual vocational system, but they also collaborated with other companies. They were using local companies' equipment and, and machines in the same shop, that, that, and then they were sharing theirs with others. So there's this cooperation between companies. We were allowed to take pictures in their training area, and as you can see, this, this was just one end of it. It was about half a block long. It was extensive, and they had all the equipment that they use actually in the shop there to help train the kids. This index company is actually owned by a foundation and you have a number of companies <coughs> that the owners gave it to a foundation so the, 
the company essentially operates for the benefit of the employees and the others, and we'll take and make proceeds for things, but it, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's quite a unique form of operation. They also did it for some tax reasons, too. <laughs> Never. Then we were uh, Wait, was, it, was that an inversion? <laughs> <laughs> We got to walk around some of the plazas before we went to our next Rotary Club meeting, our first Rotary Club meeting, and we did the exchange, and they had a program, and we didn't present at this meeting. We just spoke a little bit, but afterwards, they gave you us... You notice that Don had the same jacket on? I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say anything. When, 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 I've got 10 when of I, these. When I, when, <laughs> I pull my, when I pull my jacket out of the closet today... I knew he would wear this one. I've got one that's almost <laughs> identical. And since we were roommates in Germany and things, we have to be careful about people talking about it. <laughs> uh, when we left this Rotary Club, they gave us this beautiful bottle. Now, this is a huge, tall bottle because it has their antenna, their TV antenna on it. And that was what they were promoting. And this was actually a gift for our current uh, district governor, Diane Kirby. But as you can see, it never made it out of the hotel. Never made it to the, out of the hotel. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. <laughs> Next morning, we headed to Oberkoken for the Zeiss Corporation. And they, were vi they had a whole brochure made up for us. And it was a very extensive uh, tour. Uh, no photos allowed in the, in the process. But we got to tour their metrology, the microscopy, nano solutions, and semiconductors. Now, you may recall Zeiss is famous for their cameras and their lenses, and uh, that's where they're really ahead of everyone else right now in the semiconductors and producing the lenses that produce microchips. They probably have an 80 or 90 percent market share in making the equipment that you actually make the chips with. They have a partnership with another company. Right. If you've got a uh, uh, credit card with one of those chips on it, it probably was made in Holland because they send their, these lenses to Holland and they make them. 80% well, of the global any, any, chips. Any, any computer, anything you've got, <clears throat> probably was made with the Zeiss lens. This was as we left that very highly technical confidential area. And this gentleman here, I can't remember his name. Dick, do you remember? I can't remember. He'd been there 30 or 40 years and was retired, but he was quite a character and he knew everything about that uh, technology. I put this picture in the next day. We headed to the Chamber of Commerce, and I just want to point out, see how narrow the streets are? That's going to come and play a little bit later here. <laughs> <laughs> Very narrow streets. This is their rush hour. We went, got to the Chamber of Commerce, and they were under construction. They were putting in a new building, and uh, they were very proud of their wine vineyard in the, the back. Now, I said Stuttgart's in a valley, and they put this wine, vine vineyard on, on the sides of the hill. And this was in the backyard of their new building. So they're very proud of that. <laughs> we found out from the chamber that all companies are mandated to join the chamber. Okay? Nonprofit or, or public or whatever. They monitor this dual vocational system. They, they watch to make sure the training is standard and, and consistent. And they, they also tests. determine the sa salaries. Right. Pardon? Administer tests also. Yep. They administer the tests to make sure everything is consistent. After that, we went to another Rotary Club meeting, and this one was the uh, Bob was exchanging flags with the Rosenstein. Let me just go back to, to the, the chamber, because I, I think one of the, the major th things that really struck us about Germany is you have <coughs> a very close working relationship between education, industry, the unions, uh, and so they all work together and coordinate on these programs. The Chamber of Commerce obviously plays a very different role there because they are the standards keeper. Everybody has to belong, <coughs> and so they actually administer all the tests and do things, which gives business confidence that if they hire somebody that has been trained in another company, they will have a comparable level of skills to what they've developed. Yeah, that, that was, was very, very noticeable, is that cooperation between business schools and the chamber. Now, as we are leaving, the, uh, as we are leaving this Rotary Club and we're going to Trump, uh, we were driving along one of these narrow streets and a big 18-wheeler came up and hit the side of our car. And everything stopped and we pulled over and these 
two policemen arrived very quickly, but they were state patrol, and they said, oh, we don't handle accidents, sorry. <laughs> but they did make the, the call to the city police, and what, 20 minutes later, they finally showed up, and after a lot of paperwork, the driver was from Poland, and it was very confusing, but we, we were on our way with a scratched car, and you took care of that, right? <laughs> I, actually, we, we never, I, I think they, they took the explanation that the, the truck had just pulled over, and so no charge for us. So Dom, the other instructor, wanted his picture taken with these two policemen. <laughs> you get a lot of pictures taken too, right? <laughs> <laughs> At Trump, we, we happened to be there on their trade show day. And so we got to see, they're a stamping company and they do lasers. And so we got to see all of their latest equipment on display. So this was uh, our tour guide giving us a little bit of a, uh, this was one of the stamping machines. And interestingly enough, their guest book is not the normal kind of guest book you sign. You sign on, on a, a machine, and then they took that machine and they lasered it onto this wall and table. So your name was there for everyone to see in the future. That night, uh, we were hosted by the uh, German American Women's Club. Burns' wife, Daniela, was also the president of that club. And so we got a little more cultural input from some of the professors that were there and some of the uh, government people. Very interesting. Next morning, we went uh, on our, our way to, what was the next? Uh, on Thursday, we went to, oh, that, this was our college day. So instead of driving, we took the train down. So this was the subway. And the first stop was the University of Stutt Stuttgart. And there, they showed us all their technical classes were similar to Hennepin Tech, but they also allow the students to do their own thing. And in this case, the students built race car, and these are the trophies that these students have won internationally. And this was the president of the fraternity that built those cars, and this was their winning, most winning car that we saw that was on display there. And they are currently building the next car, and it helps to have Porsche and Mercedes and Audi all in the neighborhood, but they, you can see that they build some of the fastest cars now. Yeah, they, the one, one race they lost, the uh, engine went, or the uh, belt broke 300 feet from the finish well, it's, line. It's, it's actually something, that they do it on, on fuel economy, so they only get so much gasoline or, or fuel, yeah. and so it's a very interactive, complex thing. After the University of Stuttgart, we walked the streets and we came to Max I. Schuth, and they had this little sign for us when we arrived. And again, they went through their technical information, and they are interested in an exchange with Hennepin Technical College, both faculty and students. And Dick is getting comfortable with some of their equipment there. <laughs> And then we got back onto the train station and we were headed to another uh, Rotary Club where we, we were the program for the evening. We did the flag exchange and then we, some of these slides you saw on, on uh, the Hennepin Tech, we presented those to this group. And this is Sarah speaking and that's Andrea speaking. Next morning, we were up and we went to Lap Cabell. Now uh, they make all the cabling for a lot of these robots that you see around the world. And this one in particular, I don't know if you can make it out here. Here's the cable here, it runs along here and back. But those have to move with wherever the robot arms are going. And they test these one million times or something because the robot is constantly doing the same motions over and over and they want to make sure these things don't break. But, but this company is a very good example of what the Germans have done over many, many years. You have many companies called the middle stat, which is middle-sized companies. Some of the middle-sized companies are 500 million to a billion dollars a year, some may be more. But what they have done is they have developed uh, niches of manufacturing <coughs> that are very unique. This company, LAP, probably has an 80 or 90 percent market share in terms of the equipment, this robotic equipment that takes this very sophisticated cables and you can imagine going back and forth a million times and not breaking. 
I mean, and these cables are long. They, they've got them in very complex kinds of things. But it, it, it's just a good illustration how Germany has managed to stay competitive with high wages, good living conditions and things, because they have uh, had this long history and tradition of developing very uh, uh, sophisticated manufacturing for specific products. This is another one of their machines that uh, worked with the robotics. This is putting different kinds of bolts and screws into uh, some machine they were building. And then we had our final uh, Rotary Club, the Remstel Club, before we headed back up to the airport. And on the way, we stopped in the town of Heidelberg, a very quaint uh, town along the, the River Rhine. And this is the main street there. We found the gelati stand. <laughs> so, in summary then, on the vocational system, we found that two-thirds of the time of the student is spent on the job, and one-third is spent in the classroom. The state pays for all the tuition, and the company pays a salary to the student. Now, again, the chamber determines the first-year student gets about so much, the second year, and the third year. So that's all kind of consistent throughout the system. But it's like $20,000 a year. Yeah. After three years, then the student can decide, I want to stay with a company, go to a different company, use my technical degree for that reason, or they can take, go into what they call the gymnasium route, which is to complete their four-year college and be more into the PhD level. The net cost to a company is about 3,400 euros or $4,000 a year, so $12,000 for three years. Imagine these students are coming out after three years and they've spent, because it's 4,000 because they're, they're getting a salary, but they're getting product too. So the net cost is about 4,000. So after three years, if you had someone come to your company, knows all about your company, and is willing to be there 30, 40 years afterwards because they really like the company, and you spent 12,000 training this student, that sounds pretty good compared to what we do here in the United States after six months of hiring the person and interviewing and then they leave to another company or how many times you have to retrain somebody. So um, that's what seems to work for Germany. Our takeaways from the trip is we learned a great deal about the dual vocation system. We found that the schools and businesses are very cooperative the German culture is they look towards the long term and high quality. The structures vary between family and some nonprofits. And they encourage the students towards the technical career, but they will allow them to go the four year career too. They try to find the kids that are more tuned into the, the technical and then fast track them. Our future collaborations the Zeiss Corporation here in Maple Grove showed an interest in forming this dual system right here with Hennepin Technical College in Maple Grove. So we're hoping to develop that. Secondly, the Max I. Schulth wants to have an exchange with both students and our faculty, so we have to work on the curriculum to, to make sure those are in line. And finally, we developed some ongoing relationships with both the German Rotary Clubs and with the technical school through our students. What I would like to do very quickly, and I see we've got just a little time, uh, one, one of the major things that we discovered uh, comparing Germany to the United States is that they get involved with the students much earlier in the K-12 environment. Actually, it's K-13 in Germany. And uh, it, it really came to my attention because of Strive, where we see these students really don't know what they want to do. So one of the things I'd, I'd like to do is, is have Les maybe talk to you for a few minutes about some of the things he's doing, which to me are very exciting. And it's trying to get more of information and things out to parents and students about what career options are for them. Right now in this country, most students come to graduate from high school and don't really have the foggiest idea what they want to do. That ends up being very costly to our society. We told you the average age of the student was like 32, 33 in Hanbo Technical College. Well, if you take the difference between 18 and 32, and if somebody has spent 14 years 
what I've coined the phrase wandering, how much does that cost society? Because they, they may take this program, they may do that program. So Les, why don't you talk about what you're doing? Because he's really on the cutting edge of trying to make a number of changes in Bloomington. Minnesotans value education. Evidence of that is you, if you take our state's population, the percent that our high school graduates is one of the highest in the country. Because of that value, there's a growing mindset among our parents and the population that all children should pursue a four-year degree. College costs are increasing. We don't have any longitudinal data to show if these students are graduating and what they're earning when they do end up whether they get a degree or not. Fortunately, the bureaucracies, K-12, higher ed, and the Department of Employment and Economic Development have finally, there's a breakthrough where now we can track students longitudinally to the job for the first time. So we'll be able to get evidence about what's going on. What happens to our graduates from high school? Do they get a degree? Do, what kind of jobs do they get? We believe, and we're not going to wait for this because we think we already know what the results are going to come in at, that kids are wandering before they end up with a career. So we're creating a, a career academy in our district. And we're working in partnership with Hennepin Technical College, Normandale Community College, Dunwoody, and hopefully with businesses to do what similar, something similar to what the Germans have done, the Europeans have done. Start early give opportunities for students to explore other pathways beside the traditional conventional wisdom of go about going to a four-year college and investing a lot of money and maybe not getting your return. We think we can show that many of these kids, English is a second language, they may struggle at school, but they will, they will thrive in a different setting. And we need that with the baby boomers retiring. I just was talking to AFL-CIO president this morning. We met with the unions last, about a month ago. They're interested in partnering with us on developing a career academy to offer a different pathway for students and parents. And I think we'll show the longitudinal results that there's gonna be a big return on investment. So I'm very excited about what the, you two gentlemen have done. I think it's gonna be great. I know Bob and Don are advocating and talking to their network of friends and other influential policymakers about this. So it needs to be a partnership to move forward because I think we can set the model of what other educational organizations should be doing in the state. Thank you. Uh, other questions about the trip or, yes? Take what Leslie just said, and Bob, your experience having been past chairman of the men's group, state colleges, so you've come from a very long background in the state college system. What, what's your reaction, having seen what you've seen in Germany, knowing the bureaucracy is within men's view? What, what's going to happen? What, where did it come well, together? I can't. I have to tell you, Neil, that uh, Don and I have talked to a number of people and, and met with people both at Minsky and I also just, I had a two-hour breakfast with Bob Brunix, uh, who was a retired president of the University of Minnesota about a week ago. People are very excited. They realize that the current system is broken. We have too many students that aren't going. Now there is bureaucracy and things, but we're pitching this, and, and I'm gonna be spending quite a bit of time in the legislature talking to people about getting pilot programs going, see if we can't get some student exchanges going. Uh, I challenged Les uh, when we met, and we're gonna meet again, to think about maybe using the manpower development people to come into the schools early because they have a much more comprehensive knowledge than our counselors have. But, but I, I think uh, there's enough students, the unemployment rate for students in Germany, graduate from high school, is 7%. I mean, you look at what we have and, and the, the, the difference in that. And, and, so, and, and it's not only just the numbers, but I think the, the thing that also happens is there's a, a short window in, in a student's life where they can be challenged to do something more than they thought they could do. If you, don't, if you miss that opportunity in two or three years, four years, they get too many barnacles and it gets too hard to change. So, well, I see our president standing up and ready to shove us off. You said that it cost 4,000 for the company, or, or what was it, a year? Net, they netted. Okay, so what does it cost, because you said the 
education is paid for by the state. Did they say on how much that that they are paying for the education per student? Uh, you, I mean, in, in the United States, that one of the community colleges would be about six thousand dollars a year. Uh, the state universities would be about eight thousand. So that's comparable in Germany. We, they didn't give us a number on that. Okay. Any other questions we can stay after if you're interested? But you can see what Rotary has done and opened up some new relationships, and hopefully we can make this grow here in Minnesota.